right, good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the Tocqueville program's first lecture of the school year. We are pleased to be co-sponsoring this event with the Furman Executive Council of the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, before we begin, please silence your cell phones and put away your electronic devices. Today we are very glad to host Dr. Daniel DeSalvo, Associate Professor and Chair of the Political Science Department at the City College of New York. He's going to go give a lecture entitled, Has Party Reform Made America Ungovernable? In talking about functional and dysfunctional political party systems, I think Dr. DeSalvo's topic will align well with the Tocqueville program's interest in learning how to cultivate the art of disagreement. So before introducing today's speaker, I'd like to tell you a bit more about the Tocqueville program. As you may be interested in coming to some of our upcoming events and our ongoing activities. The Tocqueville program is organized by faculty teaching in political philosophy and is housed in the politics and international affairs department. Our interest is in gaining clarity about the fundamental moral and philosophic questions at the heart of political life. In our many curricular and extracurricular activities, which you can find out more about on the table outside, we seek to help students and faculty engage with the most powerful arguments behind competing ethical, political, and religious points of view. The intellectual community that has grown up around the Tocqueville program gathers together in the belief that shared and disciplined inquiry into contested questions will help us not only better understand the issues, but also give us precious insight into and practice in maintaining the very delicate fabric of our common life. So two upcoming to Tocqueville program activities that might be of interest to you. First, on December 4th, we will be celebrating our 10th anniversary with a lecture from outgoing AEI president Arthur C. Brooks. Brooks is one of America's foremost public intellectuals and a famously compelling speaker. He'll be delivering a lecture called Bringing America Together, which is based on a book he is working on with the assistance of former politics and international affairs alum uh, student Nathan Thompson. Mr. Thompson will be giving a lunch the next day on how what he learned at Furman has influenced his very interesting postgraduate experience. So please join us on December 4th and 5th for that. To prepare for Brooks' lecture, the Political Thought Club, which is a student-run group meeting every Friday at 3.30 from 3.30 to 4.30 in the politics seminar room, currently led by Naomi Ladine, who is over there. So see her if you're interested in hearing more about that. The Political Thought Club meets every Friday um, for an hour to read uh, a book of philosophy or literature that we don't often get the chance to do in our, in our uh, regular courses. Right now, we're preparing for Arthur Brooks' lecture by reading J.S. Mill's On Liberty, um, as well as uh, Plato's Crito, and selections from contemporary debates on open argument and inclusive campuses. So please feel welcome to join us on Friday afternoons at any time. I should mention, though, that if you join us tomorrow, you will find the Political Thought Club hosting Dr. DeSalvo as a special guest. He'll be speaking tomorrow on the question, can intellect have influence, and on his experiences working in think tanks, academics, and journalism. Which leads me to our subject tonight. Has party reform made America ungovernable? Dr. DeSalvo comes to this topic with a background in political theory, American politics, public policy, and an extensive publication record on topics such as political parties, elections, labor unions, and state government. He is the author of two books by Oxford University Press and writes frequently for both scholarly and popular publications, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Atlantic Monthly, National Affairs, City Journal, the American Interest, the Weekly Standard, the Los Angeles Times, and the New York Daily News. I dare you to try to follow his work. <laughs> it comes out so fast, you are gonna have a hard time keeping up. It also reaches an astonishingly wide range, um, covering everything from serious analysis to contemporary court cases, to delicious meditations on the intricacies of corruption in Chicago, uh, to serious analyses of the history of the discipline of politi uh, uh, political science, and reflection on what one might, one might call understudied figures such as Edward Banfield and Raymond Aron. Dr. DeSalvo has what seems like a correspondingly wide range of experience, shuttling back, between New, back and forth between New York and Puerto Rico, and spending some time during graduate school in France, as well as passing his adolescence in what sounds like a blissful situation on two small islands in the Caribbean, one no larger than five miles square. <laughs> We're delighted to have him with us here in Greenville tonight, so please join me in welcome, welcoming Daniel DeSalvo.
Well, uh, thank you, Professor Story, uh, for that really warm and, and generous uh, introduction that uh, that covered the waterfront. I'm, I'm, I'm humbled by it uh, in many ways. And I also want to thank um, the, the Tocqueville program for inviting me. I, I confess to being uh, a little intimidated. Tocqueville is one of my heroes, intellectual heroes, and um, he's, he's here, <laughs> <laughs> looking right over my shoulder. Uh, <laughs> you know, like God there, Tocqueville. So that's a little... Uh, disconcerting, but uh, I think I'll, I'll forge on. I, I'm also delighted to be here on, on campus at, at Furman. This is my first time actually in South Carolina, and it's a, uh, it's a beautiful campus, and the town of Greenville seems just delightful and charming, and the few students I've met so far seem intellectually serious and engaged, and it must be true since so many of you are, have turned out for, for this talk. Uh, I was also a little bit pleased uh, to see Arthur Brooks's title that he's going to bring America together since I'm going to tell you why that can't be done. And <laughs> despite the fact that judging by the posters, Arthur Brooks and I look almost stunningly alike, uh, we're taking opposite positions. Um, so my remarks this evening are a little bit of an exercise in, in history and, and theory. And I want to begin with, with two anecdotes. Um, so, so bear with me, these quick anecdotes, and I'm going to keep them as in the back of your mind as, as we go. And the, the first comes from a, a story told by a former U.S. Uh, representative in, in the House and a federal district court judge, uh, Abner Mikva. So Mikva's old at this point, and in 1948, he was a law student at, at the University of Chicago, and he wanted to get involved in the campaigns of uh, two leading liberal Democrats, uh, Paul Douglas, who was then running for Senate, and Adlai Stevenson, who was running for governor. And Mikva stumbled into the eighth ward of the regular Democratic Party organization. And he came in, and there was a few folding chairs and things around, and he said, well, I want to help. I want to be involved in the campaign. Some of you may have volunteered for campaigns. Well, it was kind of dead silence. He wanted to help. And then the local committeeman who's sitting there said, well, who sent you? And Mikva said, nobody. And the committeeman responded, well, son, we don't want nobody nobody sent. <laughs> Mikva was persistent, as his you know, later career showed, and he, and he kind of said, well, I really, I really won't do want to help. And the committeeman said, well, look, we ain't got no jobs. But Mikva said, but, but I don't want a job. The committeeman replied, well, we don't want nobody that don't want a job. <laughs> and then he said, well, you know, the conversation went on. And he said to, and he said, well, the committee said, well, where are you from? And Mick said, well, I'm from the University of Chicago. And the committee men ended the conversation by saying, we don't want nobody from the University of Chicago <laughs> in this organization. Um, so that might strike you as an odd story, and I'll try to shed a little light on it. The second, and in, in, in contrasting story, is that pretty much every year, uh, a student shows up in my class, and she asks me if she can make an announcement at the beginning of class, and she says she's from NYPIRG, which you've probably never heard of here in South Carolina. It's the New York Public Interest Research Group. And that's a kind of advocacy organization in New York, and they're around the country, the creation of Ralph Nader. And she just wants to enlist students to participate in voter registration drives and increase political participation. And she usually comes in and talks to the students and stresses to the students the importance of the great issues animating the election season, such as immigration, gay rights, abortion, gun control, and so on. And the message to the students is clear. Great issues are to be decided, and decisions on them won't be legitimate without your involvement. And furthermore, she says, if you want to volunteer for political campaigns, and of course, NYPIRG is a nonpartisan organization, although she always seems to only recommend the Democratic Party, um, they can volunteer for campaigns. This is New York, after all. There's not much alternative. Um, they can just go to the website and sign up. So they can go help and be involved in campaigns. So I want you to keep these two modes of political organization and participation in mind, and I'll come back to them. And I realize that the first one may strike many of you as a little bit odd and the committeeman's behavior hard to understand. So astute observers today think that 
the United States has become ungovernable. Leading thinkers such as Jonathan Rauch, the Brookings Institution, even say that our politics have gone insane. And many prominent scholars have stressed the role of large external factors deepening our political dysfunction, including economic inequality, the nationalization of politics, new communications technologies, and rising immigration and ethnic diversity. But I want to make a case to you this evening that there's an underlying problem that's internal to the political system. It's centered on the changing character of our mediating institutions, especially our political parties. And I want to persuade you this evening that a weak party system that we've created is a major part of what ails our politics. Furthermore, I want to make a theoretical argument, not only that a healthy party system is functionally essential to democracy, that's hardly original and a point that probably most people take for granted, but that, it's, that a healthy and in a way strong party system is even more democratic than direct democracy or a, uh, a plebiscite system with weak parties. And in some ways, I want to argue a little bit against Tocqueville. Uh, Tocqueville, uh, those of you reading Tocqueville in this program, uh, Tocqueville has an analysis of American political parties that he observed uh, during his time here in the United States. And he says, well, there were great political parties, and by that he meant the Federalists and the Jeffersonian Republicans, uh, you know, shortly after the revolution and the founding of the country. But now all the parties, he says, have become small. And these were small, they were just material, materialistic and local, and uh, they didn't have grand visions and grand programs, and Tocqueville kind of lamented that. Uh, well, I'm going to defend the kind of small parties as actually the stronger type that are healthier and better for democracy. So put another way, I want to suggest that strong political parties, even if flavored with a very healthy dollop of corruption, make for a better democracy than a system of weak parties or no parties at all. In short, genuine democratic participation in politics requires organization, which is not, of course, to say that all politically engaged organizations are democratic. And the primary organization for political purposes is the political party. So you, some of you may think that you want a political system that's based on really widespread participation, meaning primarily voting, openness, transparency, with candidates out there campaigning on the hustings, on the hot button issues of the day, usually divisive ideological issues like death penalty, gay rights, abortion. But I think you should be careful about what you wish for. My contention is that that kind of individualistic, plebiscitarian, politics is more likely to be undemocratic politics. So I want to go back and uh, call on George Washington Plunkett. Has anyone here ever he heard of George Washington Plunkett? He's the, well, we are in South Carolina, and this is, again, a New York figure. George Washington Plunkett was called the Sage of Tammany Hall. You, uh, everyone's heard of Tammany Hall, right? They still <coughs> mention that in high school. This was the Democratic Party machine that governed New York for about a century, uh, dominated by the Irish. And so George Washington Plunkett, you know, he was a Tammany, a party machine guy, and he defended that system. And at one point, he simultaneously held four government jobs, drawing salaries from three of them. <laughs> and, but I think he grasped the point about strong parties I have in mind. And he, as he put it, he said, look, first, this great and glorious country was built up by political parties. Second, parties can't hold together if their workers don't get the offices when they win, meaning patronage. Third, if the parties go to pieces, the government they built up must go to pieces. Fourth, then they'll be hell to pay. My contention is we are currently paying, we're, we're, we're right at number four. <laughs> so recall that I mentioned that political parties are the central mediating institutions of democratic politics. What does that mean? That means that political parties connect citizens with government institutions and they seek to manage that connection. And by doing that, they transmit and transform citizens' preferences, what people think they want government to do. And parties not only recruit candidates, mobilize voters, 
and develop policy agendas, but they informally assemble power in government. And this is a subtle point. Parties, and uh, to some extent the corruption they bring with them, <laughs> have in the past been relied upon, you could say, to bring ambitious politicians under civil discipline. If we take away the parties and their function as brokers, <laughs> governing becomes impossible and we end up with all kinds of individual operators. Just think of the US Senate today where almost every third senator thinks he, he or she is running for president and they have their own campaign organization and their own base and their own constituency and there's almost nothing that can bring them under, as I put it, civil discipline. In that light, little could be of greater importance than the party system. If our mediating institutions are not working well, it should not be surprising that our political institutions are not working well. And today, everyone knows that citizens are unhappy with government. Trust in government, as well as approval ratings of Congress and the President, are at often historic lows. So let me set the table for my argument with a couple basic points. The most salient characteristic, you could say, of the American system of government is its extreme fragmentation of formal authority due to the separation of powers and federalism. The system is highly porous, or in the wooden language of modern political science, it contains multiple veto points. When American government acts, it does so on the basis of lots of small, petty, sometimes shady compromises hammered out among competing interests. So here's the rub. When legal power is really fragmented among all these different elected officials and it's decentralized between different levels of government, the need for informal methods of assembling power goes up. Party mediation, therefore, is more important in the American political system than in other democratic systems. You could say it's the low but only road to find the terms on which many holders of bits and pieces of power can be brought together to collaborate. Despite this great need for political parties and mediation, there's a, there has been across American history from the founding to the present a persistent theme of aversion to political parties. Nobody likes them. The founders, prominent citizens, thinkers have all held that political parties distort the popular will and encourage bad public policy. George Washington's farewell address is devoted this theme. Thomas Jefferson says he won't go to heaven if he has to go there with a political party, despite, well, then founding a political party, but <laughs> leave that aside. Thomas Jefferson, uh, Th John Adams looks with, as he's put dread on the prospect of the nation being divided into two giant political camps or political parties. And the parties, the critics argue, get in the way from power flowing up from the people, the, the only true legitimate source of authority, or down from the experts with technical public policy knowledge. There are sources of corruption, distortion, and mismanagement. And in response, res reformers of various stripes across American history have sought to reform the political parties and to make government more responsive in their view to the people or to empower experts to increase government's effectiveness. As a result, you could say ever since the 1830s, there's just been an ongoing war in American politics over the structure of political parties. And the war over political parties has huge implications for democratic representation and you could say the tone and style of politics. On one side is what we might, I'll call the organized model of political parties. That's a little bit like the first anecdote uh, that I began with. And on the other is what some people have called the voluntary or volunteer or participatory or pub publicitary model of political parties. And that sort of fits with my second anecdote, anecdote that I began with. And the antipathy between the champions of both of these two models has, has been intense. Uh, one of our greatest political scientists, James Q. Wilson, noted in a classic study of big city parties in 1962 that the reformers accused the professionals, meaning the machine guys, of being at best hacks and organization men and at worst bosses and machine leaders. And of course the reformers 
And the professionals call the reformers as dilettantes, crackpots, outsiders, and hypocritical do-gooders. So let me give you a little bit of a description of each of these two models of political party. The organized model was comprised of the professionals that ran these organized parties in state and local government throughout the country. These were the leaders, operatives, elected officials, job seekers that comprised the party organizations. They, they were people like the committee men I described sitting in that office in the 8th Ward of Chicago. And they, saw, they came from these kind of intensely local groups and sought to capture the resources of government, the famous spoils system of jobs, contracts, and favors to reward their loyalists. These party machines were the major get-out-the-vote operations whose precinct captains, district leaders, and other agents enlisted citizens and, and immigrants to vote for candidates that were selected and vetted by the bosses. Again, think the model here is Tammany Hall in New York or the Daily Machine in Chicago. Those are both Democratic examples, but you, you could easily find in the country Republican ones. Uh, the Republicans had a very powerful statewide machine for years in Pennsylvania or the Nassau County, which is the really <coughs> strongly urbanized section of Long Island in New York. Uh, here in the South, you had less the machine style, but what was often called the courthouse ring. It had a slightly different name. Um, if any of you have ever seen uh, the show anymore, The Dukes of Hazard, is that, has anyone still heard of that? Uh, maybe it's not politically correct anymore. Uh, well, there's, there's Boss Hogg, and Boss Hogg is basically the leader of a courthouse ring. It's him and the sheriff, and that's, that was sort of how Southern politics mimicked the North. The Southern politics was much different, and partly because it wasn't comp as competitive, but a similar idea was at work. And these party machines created a kind of particular <coughs> tone and style of politics. And our New York Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan sort of once described the politics of the party regulars as, quote, a decent, quiet family affair. The highest priority is assigned to those things which keep it so, patronage, small and not so small favors, the strict observance of complex prerogatives of party members on various levels, and a sharp dislike for those who disrupt its orderly hierarchical functions. Think back to why they didn't really want that guy from the University of Chicago. <coughs> they weren't sure. He didn't want a job. He, that means he couldn't be bought. If he couldn't be bought, he couldn't stay bought. Uh, how would the, his loyalty be maintained? He might have ideas about policies. He's from the University of Chicago. He needs to be kept out. For the party regulars, divisive issues are supposed to be kept off the table as much as possible. The organization has a past, a present, and a future to consider. Winning elections is the number one goal. Losing them often meant losing one's job and losing the jobs of your loyalists, people you got jobs in the sanitation department or uh, in the Department of Education. Those were the important jobs, or in the police department. So the good of society or the public interest for, in this, for this type of party was seen as the product or consequence of the party's victory over time. So you could say, unlike what, what I'll get to is the volunteer <coughs> model, the party's primary objective is winning. It's not the public good. The public good flows from winning, whereas it, it's the opposite. So you could say the volunteer model is comprised of a completely different type of people with a completely different tone or style, sometimes called middle class reformers or amateurs, or today we would call them political activists. They sought to change the structure of the parties. And these often were people who were uh, journalists, some academics, people with jobs outside of politics. Politics wasn't their main day-to-day -day way to earn a living. And some, they obviously could recruit politicians who had fallen out of favor with the local machine. And what they want was a more open, transparent, no backroom deals, no smoke-filled rooms, if you've ever heard that phrase. And they wanted more what's sometimes called programmatic or ideological parties. That meant parties that put their program first, the policies they wanted to enact, or their ideological positions on controversial issues. So divisive issues are front and center their vision of the public good. That's what politics is about. So you could say that for the middle class reformer or activist in the, the party they want to seek 
type they want to bring about is going to be people voluntarily, hence volunteer, entering the political system and acting on their own and not being reliant on the political system for uh, material rewards like jobs or favors. And for them, the whole point of politics is advancing a grand public purpose, fighting for justice, right? Uh, an abstract principle, that's what they're in it for. And politicians, therefore, who compromise those grand principles for the sake of interest or power, you know, are, have sold their souls and lost their legitimacy. Whereas the whole point of, you could say, the organized model of political parties was to compromise and fudge and sort of move things along. So there, these, you could say the volunteer model party is really built on ideals and policies. And they're suspicious of compromise, loyalty, insiders. And their really core mode of operating is to put forward ideals and then ask the public to vote on them. Therefore, the program, you could say, of reformers was to eliminate things that held the old parties together. That is, patronage jobs, getting a job, say, for your cousin in the sanitation department or something, um, which were the party's lifeblood by instituting civil service rules for government employment. They called for direct election of U.S. senators. They advocated direct democracy methods, such as the initiative, referendum, and recall to dom bypass party-dominated legislatures. And they fought for primary elections to remove the selection of candidates from the party organization and turn it over to voters. I think it's fair to say today that the reformers have won the volunteer party model has prevailed. That's, in a sense, what we have. State party leaders as a powerful force in our politics have largely disappeared. Urban machines like Tammany Hall or the Daily Machine in Chicago are, are dead. Governmental authority has been centralized and rationalized. Perhaps not surprisingly, more extreme candidates, that is, more ideological or programmatic candidates, have been nominated by the parties and elected to office. Members of Congress now increasingly vote al straight along straight party lines. And the electorate has sorted itself into liberal and conservative camps. And our polarized parties increasingly campaign on the most divisive, hot button issues. In short, you could say the reformers have destroyed the old parties by improving them. The result is that America's political parties have gotten weaker without our politics becoming more democratic. Parties have handed over control of candidate nominations to primary voters. Candidates now largely operate their own candidate, their own campaign organizations with only limited assistance from the parties. Millions of campaign finance dollars flow to outside groups rather than directly to the parties. That is, they've outsourced the corruption. Parties have declined in the electorate with only a third of voters, uh, with, a, with about or over a third, almost 40% of voters now declaring themselves independents. <coughs> so the point I also really want to stress is that these, this weaker party system, which is so much more contingent on it being citizens are really only called into political action to vote either on candidates or on proposals put forward and not to really participate in any other vigorous way. The point I want to stress is that our new, this new party system that we have today or the weaker party system is extremely poor at assembling political power in government. The parties can't discipline their members. The Republicans, for example, in recent years have been barely able to elect a Speaker of the House and then the speaker, once elected, can barely control his conference. Uh, John Boehner, when he was a speaker of the House before Paul Ryan, said, you know, look, I, I can't get too far out in front of my uh, members because, you know, what's a leader with no followers? It's just a guy taking a walk. And ultimately, he, was, had, he found he was finding himself taking too many walks alone and retired as speaker, and Paul Ryan has now stepped down as speaker. Every third senator is running for president. But this gives us assembling power to take action. So the truth is that open, transparent, programmatic parties have not been good for governing or for the nation's civic health. 
Few major laws are passed, pressing issues are left hanging or unaddressed. The new party system, you could say, also empowers the elite. What's bemoaned today is the establishment. Parties are reduced to their individual atomized constituencies, and parties become, in a sense, personal flavors built around personalities and issue positions. Voting today permits really the citizen a choice between self-selected candidates in primary elections or the right to ratify or reject propositions manufactured by organized elites. So in that sense, this kind, the new party system, my contention is, ends up with a very weak or brittle and fragile sense of democratic politics is actually not very democratic at all. In addition, the tone of politics has become rancorous. Issue politics, that is putting those divisive principled issues at the forefront, which the old party machines always tried to keep off the table, makes for principled politics, but that makes compromise a dirty word. And when politics is all about issues, issues quickly seep into people's identities. There's a reason your grandmother tells you not to discuss politics along with religion at the dinner table. Partisan hostil hostility quickly becomes personal hostility. And I'll just give you a few examples. According to the, uh, Pew, near majorities of each party view the other party as, quote unquote, a threat to the nation's well-being. And they see the other side as, you know, in extraordinarily skeptical and alien terms. That is, they, they misperceive the other side. For example, Democrats appear to believe that almost 50% of Republicans are evangelical Christians, but just a third are. And Republicans ap appear to believe that over a third of Democrats are atheists or agnostic, but in fact only about 10% are. And consider, too, that from 1960 to 2010, the percentage of Democrats and Republicans who said that members of their own party were more intelligent than those of the opposition party grew from 6 to 48 percent, and the percentage describing members of the opposition party as, quote, selfish rose from 21 to 47 percent. Further, and this is the last example, you could say, 33% of Democrats and 49% of Republicans would be somewhat or very unhappy if their child married someone of the other party. <laughs> it's actually higher than marrying someone of another religion. Um, people are fine, or even another race for that matter. People are fine with interracial marriages, interfaith marriages, but no intrapartisan marriages. Um, I would say all this bodes ill for civil and civic debate, something I know that the Tocqueville program is championing, and I, and I applaud them for their efforts in face of a, 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 some stiff challenges. Um, and, and I think it bodes ill for the requirements of democratic citizenship. Finally, our issue-oriented parties are increasingly detached from the middle and lower classes. The adoption of uh, primaries to s select presidential candidates, um, in addition to primaries to select pretty much all candidates for pretty much every office today, has caused <coughs> highly educated upper middle class voters to take control of the Democratic Party and to push to the sidelines organized labor and voters with less education. Instead of a party system where you could say up until at least the early 70s, one party, here the Democrats, represented the interests of the working class and the other party, the Republicans, represented interests of the interests of business and the wealthy, the party system that since emerged is one where both parties really in some ways represent different slices of the well-heeled. The result has been the alienation and dissatisfaction of large swaths of downscale voters, many of whom backed candidates who weren't even really, until right before the primaries, members of the primary that, or members of the party they were contesting the primary in, uh, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. In short, my contention is weak political parties are bad for democracy. Yet few would propose returning, even if we could, to the stronger political parties of yesteryear. I'd say that rather than try to offer you some sort of solution to our predicament, which 
in some ways. Maybe I'll leave that to Arthur Brooks. Um, but in my view, it's probably be a waste of words. I want to focus your attention a little bit in uh, the conclusion of my remarks on what this long war over party structure reveals about our political principles or about each of the way we think about the kind of democracy that we want. At bottom, you could say the battle over party structure between those favoring the volunteer model and those favoring the organizational model is about what kind of democracy we want or the kind of democracy we're at least willing to accept. So you could say consider two ideal types of democracy. One might be called party democracy and the other can be called um, a plebiscite democracy. In general, in the first one, the citizen is more passive and in the latter they're more active at least when it comes to voting. And the former model really only contends that the legitimacy of government action it just requires that the government be held accountable by party competition in free and fair elections. And participation in that model is really one where uh, it's more intense on the part of a fewer number of people but that it better represents all. The plebiscite model, on the other hand, holds that government actions are only legitimate if they're expressions of the popular will, which is usually reflected only in high voter turnout. So you need to have this connection between the popular will and strong leaders. Leadership becomes a, a term in this model, a, an important view in this model of democracy. There have to be leaders that articulate people's desires and their preferences and the policies they want. And then people vote to, in effect, ratify uh, those positions. Now, I would say that in some ways, the, those are the two uh, alternatives. You could say one, which is more decent. And, and I would say these two alternatives reveal uh, different, you could say, philosophical convictions about government or different philosophical preferences. And I'll just sketch the two sides. I'm not going to take a position in either way, but get people to think about. It, I don't think it corresponds to liberals or conservatives today, and I don't think it responds to Republicans and Democrats today. I could make the case that, in fact, these principles are cross-partisan and cross-ideological, but I invite you instead to think about which uh, group of principles you hold the most. You could say that those that favor the volunteer model have tended to also favor more radical or rapid change. That is, they want the political system to be more immediately responsive to public preferences. What George Gallup, the great pollster, once called polling democracy. What the public preferences are today, they should be translated into public policy tomorrow. And in that respect, it also favors greater direct democracy meaning citizens voting directly on legislation or on recalling judges or other modes or setting up or voting directly on what should be on the political agenda, the, the initiative. Third, you could say it, it involves a high estimation of the power of human reason, that is, people's ability to truly engage in civic debate and not allow that to be filtered through their partisan preferences. And a high confidence in technical knowledge to solve social problems. You could say this view has also tended to attract people who favor abstract principles of justice, especially individualism and rights. Individual rights and some abstract principles of justice that need to be realized right away and people who prefer grand versions or grand visions of the public good are often attracted to the volunteer model as the quickest and fastest and royal road to achieving that. And that's the, the plebiscite model of democracy. You could say those favoring the alternative, the party democracy or the organizational model, tend to favor slow change or slow gradual reform or sometimes people call gradualism chipping away at a problem over time. And they also tend to be very attracted to the notion that people are not atomized individuals <coughs> with policy preferences but are people are bound by webs of obligation 
that is, their loyalty and solidarity with institutions of which they're a part is paramount. And the idea, you could say that groups and individuals are also tied in a historical continuity between past and future, rather than the, we need to realize the principles of abstract justice now, we want to think about those over time. And they tend to have a different conception of what people know or can know when it comes to social policy. And they rely more on, you could say, experience and accumulated social wisdom than on technical knowledge as a guide to public policy. And ultimately, they're much more comfortable with the notion that participation in politics is about winning and gaining power and less about realizing some grand vision. And politics is partly a game and it's partly sport. People forget that a little bit in our intense, but if you go back and you look at the old party machines, a lot of the, what they did was sing songs and joke around and it allowed adults to behave like kids. <laughs> And, uh, you know, there was a kind of good-natured bonhomie because winning and losing was paramount. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, and you learn a kind of sportsmanship. Um, and that notion of sportsmanship uh, is, in a sense, if you're really fighting for some abstract principle of justice, uh, there's no real way to be sportsmanlike with the other side. They're, they're for something that's, uh, that's evil or wrong, um, and you can't support that. So I go back to the two examples with, with which I began. Um, my earnest uh, Nyperg student and our committee men in Chicago, and you can see reflected in those these two different models. I'm not trying to suggest that we can go back to uh, the old machines or that you would want to. There's downsides um, to those uh, styles of politics. There is lots of corruption, <laughs> um, and there certainly was, and there is lots of irrational policy making that goes on. But I, I, what I've tried to do today, tonight is just to lay out the alternatives. And if people wanted to be serious about doing something uh, like returning to the old thing, we might want to th rethink things like primary elections. Right? Should we have primaries to elect candidates? Or should we go back to a system where parties were semi-closed, private organizations that could, through their own internal battles and people could officially join the party and participate intensely in its procedures and process and allow it to pick its candidates. That would be a kind of organizational question. Would that produce, in fact, a better, more civil uh, style of politics than our currently open, <coughs> transparent, and freewheeling party system? I'll leave it there. And I'll feel my, I'll, sorry. I'll leave it there. <laughs> And you, I, I'll field my own questions. Please, don't be shy. I'm from New York. <laughs> Dig right in. So I'm from Chicago. Great. So I know um, the daily political machine. So the, the entire time, I've just been thinking about this one story when, um, I'm sure you've heard of it, when Martin Luther King came to visit daily to talk about the state of um, civil rights in Chicago, which was not well at the time. And Daly took him on a ride around Chicago, around the neighborhoods, uh, and Martin Luther King would point out all these things. And the next day, Daly had fixed all of it. And Martin Luther King, you know, prayed that the victory had left, but they never really fixed the true issue there. And that's sort of the biggest trend I see with uh, machine politics is that you have, uh, you get to a point where you have people who have a, such a majority that they can ignore um, the other half or the other portion of people they don't want to represent because they don't have to. I think that's a, a terrific question. There's a, or, I don't know if it's a question per se, it's a comment, but uh, it, it provokes a lot of reactions. And I think there's two really important things in what you suggest, which is one, there is a downside to the machines. They can be, gradualism has its costs, right? Justice takes longer to be realized. Um, Black uh, Americans in Chicago were not I well integrated into the daily machine and really only, uh, in a sense, took power in Chicago once the machine was defeated, in a sense, in a competitive election in the early 80s and Harold Washington uh, became the first black mayor of Chicago, which was good. And that leads to my second point, which is 
the machines are dangerous if they don't have any competition. You have to have the possibility that someone can come and defeat the machine. Um, in New York, for example, even in the heyday of its greatest strength of Tammany, Tammany didn't always win. Uh, occasionally, um, you could say that the Republicans, which represented largely the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant elite of New York City, would find some way to get together a coalition and elect a mayor. And that would be enough to, uh, enough competition to keep the machine, you could say, honest. I mean, in some <coughs> ways you could say that Illinois has had this problem metastasized from Chicago to the statewide yeah. problem um, with a major machine run by Michael Madigan, the Speaker of the House, who's been Speaker of the House for, I think, almost 38 years now. Um, yeah. but controls both the Chicago Democratic Party and the statewide Democratic Party with a pretty iron fist. Uh, but there you just haven't had competition. So you need some amount of competition. So what I would be recommending is not these one-sided machines, but ones where there's uh, machines on both sides and they can uh, have some kind of reasonable competition um, because without it you end up with those kind of distortions. So that's a great comment. Um, I don't think our, our system favors it and has nothing to do with, with human nature. Um, it has everything to do with the structure of our, um, our electoral laws and our political system. So you could say, there's, I'll give you three factors going against the creation of a durable national third party. Right? At state and local level, I think there's more opportunities for third parties to play important roles than they often do, especially in urban politics. But at the national level, you have three basic factors going against the creation of a third party. The first is of what's called um, plurality elections, or first past the post elections, which means all you have to do is win the majority of votes, not 50%, which in an old political scientist named Maurice Duverger, it's one of the kind of few laws that political science has ever even come close to discovering, which is plurality systems yield two parties. Why? Because if you have three candidates in a plurality system, one candidate gets 40 and the other two split and get 30 each, what's the incentive the next time around? Let's get together and we'll beat the guy that got 40. <laughs> so it's a powerful incentive for a two-party system to emerge. Second is the electoral college. Because electoral college votes are allocated, again, on a plurality basis in almost every state um, except for two, take Ross Perot. How, many, how old were you guys when Ross Perot ran for election? <laughs> Not born. So <laughs> you were studying it from the heavens, uh, as I expect you were. Um, and you were studying Ross Perot's campaign. Does anyone remember how many votes, uh, how, what percentage of the popular vote Ross Perot won in 1992? 33%. 33%? That's a little high. Anyone remember? About 19.5. Usually people round it up and give them 20% of the popular vote. How many electoral college votes did Ross Perot win? Zero. Because in every state, Bush, Poppy here we're talking about, not. W. <laughs> and Clinton won a plurality, and so they collected all the electoral college votes. So that obviously is a, the electoral college would be factor number two. And you could say factor number three, despite our current polarization, there's lots of evidence, especially if you read books by Morris Fiorina, that shows that the American public's political opinions and political attitudes remain fairly moderate, meaning the ideological divide in the United States is still fairly narrow and within the broad spectrum of what you could say is liberalism with a capital L. And in that respect, we, don't, we haven't had like European countries, uh, you could say fascist, par openly fascist parties or in France, m monarchical parties or strong communist parties, the communist party or even a real social, strongly overtly socialist party in the United States. So in that respect, the ideological spectrum is narrower and that makes it easier for two parties to represent them. So I'd say that's the factors, and they're big ones, working against the third party thing. Now, look, third parties can play really important, powerful roles 
in in lots of local and small elections, even for elections of the House. I mean, if you come to New York, you'll see the uh, Working Families Party is a left-wing party that positions itself to the left of the Democrats, and that has a really important role in shaping New York City and even to some extent New York State politics. Um, and that's, so that's an important factor, and that's a, that's a third party, but it's not present on the national stage, and, and it's never going to be. The Greens did that for a while in California. Anyway, I won't go up to them. Good question. Yeah. You're not. Two, two things. Well, first is that you're trying to combine two things, which is you're trying to combine the person who's going to be elected has to come out and campaign with their program, not shaped by the party's program. That gives them much more freedom of maneuver, right, to make the, what the parties would have considered wild statements and overpromise and rile ethnic and racial antagonisms, right, because they can do that because there's no mediation. There's nothing in between them and the voters they're trying to appeal to. It's the mediation that tries to, in a way, put a, a net around them, right, and control the, that ambitious politician, right, from not over-promising, over not riling ethnic antagonisms, right? What the voters have in the strictly, you could say, plebiscite model is the candidate and what they're presenting and them, and that there's nothing in between, right? And you can see the ferociousness of competition when there's nothing in between that's trying to gather together individual citizens' preferences and then form them into something of a popular will and transmit that to a candidate and say, you need to rein that in. Right. So that's an excellent question. Please. Hi, can you just briefly describe what you think the role of the media has been in maintaining a large party system and what you believe I'll take the f <laughs> no, it's an absolutely terrific question. If we went back, not only has there been, as I suggested, this war over party structure, but obviously external factors such as the rise of modern media has had a huge role in displacing. You want to think about what displaced these old machine parties like the Daily Machine in Chicago. Two things, you could say. One is media, because you no longer needed the parties um, to be the main conveyors of political information. The media could now directly do it, and it also gave politicians a way to directly appeal uh, to citizens. They didn't need the party as their channel of communication. So the media has a huge role in displacing the old party. And then second is the rise, you could say, of the welfare or the administrative state. A lot of functions that the parties used to perform, social welfare functions, helping people get uh, coal and oil to heat their homes in the 19th century, uh, are now all taken over by the central administrative state and run by professional bureaucracies with professional civil servants, right? And no longer by patronage appointees of, of the parties. So in that sense, the media is really important. But the media is also, again, this unmediated communication, right? I mean, think about the fascination with President Trump's tweets because it's unmediated <laughs> communication. A thought appears in his mind and it goes onto his Twitter account. There's, and in that sense, he has done one better than all the, um, the tech billionaires who are buying up the Washington Post and everything. He says, what do I need to buy a newspaper for? I have my Twitter account. It's this unfiltered uh, presidential mind coming out. And in that sense, that's like the, the epitome of unmediated political discourse with all the good and bad sides of that. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I don't, I, I can't predict the future. Political science's uh, record on predicting the future is a little bit 
not much better than monkeys throwing uh, darts at a, a board. So in that respect, I wouldn't want to predict the future. <laughs> Crises are obviously in all political systems. Uh, you don't have to just believe Rahm Emanuel. Um, are a time for major political change. I mean, there's major political change, you could say. But I think one thing to keep in mind here is not just that some crises would spur this. If you think about the broad sweep of American political history in regards to its party system, I think there's a strong case that one could make that the party system from the 1830s really until the 1960s didn't change fundamentally. And lots of crises happened. There were major depressions of the late 19th century. There was, even through the, new, the, the Great Depression, the New Deal, two world wars, industrialization, and the party system kind of plugged along without changing very much. And then it really changed quite rapidly in beginning in the 1970s and up to our day. So really for three quarters of the country's history, we had one system and then since then we've had this other one. Uh, that I've tried to give you a little bit of a description of that hasn't really corresponded as much to crises or external events. Um, so that's a bold statement on my part, I think, but I, it's, it merits more study. So I've, I'm a little skeptical that crises are what are going to drive these changes. Um, that is, the party system of 1960 was more like the party system of 1860 than the party system of 1960 is the more like the party system of 1980. Uh, well, Ralph Nader was a third party candidate. In this decision was that the parties, there was no difference between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. How, how, do, you, how do you feel about Ralph Nader's criticism of the two major political parties? Well, that was probably in some ways the case. Many people today, when we see our parties so polarized, would say, well, wouldn't it be nice if they were more alike? Um, that is, there, were more, there was more bipartisan legislation, more compromise. Uh, so, and that would make for a, a more civil and amicable, uh, it would reduce the volume, you could say, of the media discussion in Washington. So he was complaining about that at, at one time, but now in light of, you could say, where we are today in 2017, maybe what he was complaining about looks actually more attractive. <coughs> at the same time, you could say that uh, I think Nader, when he was arguing that, um, when he was running for president in 2000, I think most observers said, look, Bush and, and Gore are pretty far apart, and there are big differences uh, between the Republican and Democratic parties, even at that time. So I guess I wouldn't be sure I would have even bought into his analysis at that point. Please. How do you characterize the influence of unrestrained uh, financial contributions? Um, characterize it in what, what way? Uh, spin thumbs out a little up, more. Thumbs up, thumbs down. <laughs> <laughs> you um, know, it's going to help us, it's going to kill us. I think, you know, my own view is that, it's so a little background. If we think back to these older parties, wh where did money for politics come from, let's say, for most of the country's history, most of the 19th century? It came from within the political system itself, which is, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, I'll stick to my New York examples since I've already given a lot of them. But in New York, um, the Republican Party, which was controlled upstate in most of Long Island in the 19th century, it would appoint workers to work at the customs office in Lower Manhattan, which was, there was no income tax then, so how did the government raise revenue? By tariffs and customs. And those workers were there, and sometimes they took, those workers would work for their jobs while they were paid as official government employees in the customs office. But part of their daily duties would also be, as an example, to work on party affairs, which meaning that was also, they were at their official job, but nominally they were doing something else. And there was also a fair amount of, well, we charge this uh, sh incoming ship this amount for the tariff, but we need a little more for the party. So political contributions, you could say in that way, both in manpower and finance often came from within the system, not from outside donors like we have now. In terms of where we are today with campaign finance, I think the McCain-Feingold Act, which is a, uh, that was passed in 2002, the Bipartisan Campaign Finance Reform Act, was very bad for political parties. And very bad, it was a, another 
reform step to weaken political parties because its primary objective was to take, I don't want to go get too technical on campaign finance, take soft money, meaning unlimited contributions that had been being funneled through the parties and channel them to all outside groups. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, the um, total amount of money, in my view, is not a problem. It's how the money is channeled. Money is going to be in politics, as one of the great Jesse Unruh, great California uh, party guy once said, money is the mother's milk of politics. So if that's the case, you've got to just more think about not so much the amount that's there, but more how it's channeled and who controls it. And I think we would be, it's my own opinion, if I can offer it, is that we would be better off having it channeled through the parties, which would be more traceable, more transparent, than put into all of these different shadow outside groups that, that aren't as easily controllable or controlled. Um, so I, I guess I'm less concerned about the total amounts. Um, you know, just to give you an example, you know, 2004 election, I think total federal spending by candidates and outside groups was, um, I think, around $4 billion, um, which, you know, sounds like a lot of money, but that's about the same amount that just one firm, admittedly a big one, Walmart, spent on advertising that year. And you wonder in the modern world for having a civic national campaign in a huge, uh, country like ours, whether that's really too much money. Um, it doesn't seem to me, in fact, it's often political scientists are more interested, in why isn't there more money in politics if, if they're supposedly buying so much with it? Um, so I'm less worried about the money and more worried about where it goes and how that shapes our politics. <coughs> doesn't preclude them, it just tries to say, keep them at home. Um, the, your absolute truth commitments are things that the party says, look, that's great, um, but the or you can imagine the committee men, if you went into the committee men in the 8th district ward and said, well, I have these absolute truth commitments about uh, justice and what needs to be done to realize justice right away. He says, well, you're exactly the kind of person we don't want in our organization um, because you're not willing to compromise and you're not willing to kind of play along. And so in that sense, it's not saying that those things aren't important. They are, but it's just trying to rank them on a scale of saying, what do you want foregrounded in your politics? Everyone's absolute truth commitments or a willingness to sort of go along and to get along. And obviously some people are not, they think that's, selling out, that's selling your soul, that's corrupt, right? Um, so uh, that, that you're, you're really going to the philo philosophical core of the trade-off that you'd have to accept between the, the two models. So this is, this is somewhat of a bitter pill to swallow, so this is, but it is perfectly the same better than it should. So I'm trying to wrestle with, <laughs> wrestle with what you're saying. I'm, I would say those are th those are those kinds of strong, I, I could use your word, absolute kind of truth commitments are things that aren't going to be at home in a genuine party system that is a participatory in a vigorous sense of people hashing it out and coming up with a winning strategy. 
And I would say if we look at American history, we see that those kind of commitments for most of American history played themselves out outside the party system, the civil rights movement, to go back uh, to your example. But one could also think of prohibition, for example, as a powerful and deeply informed moralistic commitment. That wasn't something that came up really through the party system. It came up through social movements. Um, you could think of uh, women's suffrage movements that didn't come through the party system. It came from outside it. So I think that what you're trying to balance over time in politics is really the amount of choice and change. And it's sometimes <coughs> the case that these older machines were too slow and flat-footed and they didn't change fast enough and that inspired people with strong moral commitments to come into the political system and force more rapid change. But what you're trying to get overall, I think, in your political system is um, is rather than the realization of the, all these abstract ideas, is keeping your politicians who are really ambitious people and they want to do, do things. They want to go down in history. They want to have legacies. Presidents, for example, sen major senators, is keeping these people a little bit in check. <laughs> and, kind of, and that sets a broader tone, you could say, for society and how people are going to talk about politics and things around the dinner table. They're not going to immediately jump to abortion or to the death penalty or other really divisive issues that people feel really strongly about, but they're going to talk about issues in a different way and they're gonna talk about more local issues and the parties in that respect can be a kind of sheet anchor against going all the way up to the, you could say, to the absolutes right away. And that, in that sense, they focus people back to sort of local issues, local politics, local party competition, who's winning, who's losing. Um, be one that the, it's a great question, obviously, much more to be said. Would you agree that um, perhaps a gifted statesperson could both do the kind of compromising necessary to get the people's business done um, through a party, and, uh, but also hold out principle in a way that's quite visible? And I, I would suggest somebody like Lincoln might be. Yeah, you stole, you got to, you stole Lincoln. I was going to say Lincoln. <laughs> um, well, I think there you'd want to make a distinction. We could make a distinction between the politician and the statesman. Mm -hmm. The politician is there to, you know, cut deals, do, manage things, keep things roughly in check, sort of keep society uh, peaceable and in relative harmony. Whereas the statesman is someone who can combine those things into a grand vision, but also work the kind of compromise. I don't know, if, have any of you seen the movie Lincoln? Anyone in the class? Well, I, that's your weekend homework if you haven't seen it. Um, because it does show another side to Lincoln. He, to get the 13th Amendment passed, the movie, should, he is doing deals. And he's got some agents working for him who are doing some unsavory stuff. But he also has a grander vision, right, in that statesmanship, you could think of other examples like Churchill. Uh, you have a grander vision that you're trying to achieve, and you have the skills and ability to do some of the more rough and tumble parts of politics as well. Most of the time, the politicians overwhelm the potential statesmen, right? They're more cynical, they're more easily bought off, right? So statesmen are rare, politicians are common. Um, so I think that would be one way to think about it. Well, see, I think uh, that would they also. Are yeah. Yeah, I guess my, I, I think this goes to the point that is people that say uh, your <coughs> argument, which is I want term limits because that will inject new ideas or new visions into the political system. That's already you could say moving towards the volunteer model, which is to say politics is about issues, it's about visions, 
And so in that sense, you could say having term limits um, is a good thing because we'll get new people that are going to come in and they're going to passionately bring in and defend new ideas, whereas you could say someone who is taking the alternative position might say, look, there's a kind of wisdom that comes from uh, senators serving long or politicians serving long terms. That is, they have accumulated knowledge and experience, uh, and it gives them incentives to not try to put the most divisive thing right on the table right away because they know they're going to be kicked out of office after their next term. They say, look, I'm a repeat player. I can come back and try to get what I wanted to do done in the future. Uh, so there could be alternatives. You trade off experience versus vision um, in the term limits example. Last question. Oh, last one? OK. Well, th there's a few more hands, but maybe I'll take uh, one and then please. Uh, quick comment. I just moved here, back here from yeah. California. Uh, they implemented uh, term limits, and now you just have musical chairs. Right. <laughs> There's the musical chairs problem, yeah. Uh, this gentleman hasn't asked so, one yet. Um, going, how, how do you see gerrymandering playing a role in the organizational party system? How do I see it? Um, today, historically, uh, um, Well, okay, uh, well, I'll see what pops into mine. <laughs> uh, as a historical matter, obviously there's been major changes in the way the districts um, are drawn. Um, many states, especially in the South, did not redistrict much, and this led to great imbalances between urban and rural districts, um, which then led to a major set series of Supreme Court cases um, Reynolds versus Sims, Baker versus Carr in the 1960s where the Supreme Court, which had always deferred to the political branches on this, um, got involved and came up with a rule um, that they call one person, one vote. It's not ex exactly that. Um, then the Voting Rights Act intervened um, and that created a new phenomenon in later years, again based on some three Supreme Court decisions called majority-minority districts. Um, which tend to have increased representation of African Americans, especially in the, in the House. So where are we today with all of that? Um, can I, can I finish that? So sure. I, I think what I was trying to uh, get towards was, it seems like the, the reformers in the more volunteer model would want to perform gerrymandering. Yeah, to the extent that gerrymandering is seen as that much of a problem, they probably would, yeah. Okay. So would, an organi would, would someone favoring the organizational party system still want to perform gerrymandering if the House are clear? Probably slowly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, remind us of the basic historical points of inflection in the history of And I, I know you don't like to say history, but no. um, uh, is there anything we can see from these moments at which there's an, a big shift the, um, in our, our way of structuring our politics that might set, shed some light on the present? I would say the, the, the major moments, if we want to give you a back of the napkin periodization of American political history on this front, really are, you could say, from the beginning of uh, the end of the founding period with the, with the ratification of the first 10 amendments of the Constitution uh, in, in 1793, you really at that point have two, you, you could call them elite parties or parties of notables, the Jeffersonian Democrats and the Federalists. Th that system kind of collapses and falls apart with the collapse of the Federalist Party, but really once you get mass-based participatory and what in my view truly democratic political parties is begins in the, in the 1830s um, and that system really lasts a long time. It faces its really first large challenge beginning at the end of the 19th century with efforts to introduce civil service reform. You have to remember that in the end of the 19th century presidents um, 
we're appointing you know, 40 or 50,000 people to the federal service. That's how many jobs change are. Change going. Today it's about you know 3,500 or 4,000, depending on how many you count, and that's still way more than most European democracies. Um, then the second big challenge would be beginning in the uh, progressive era in the beginning first two decades of the 20th century, which is when uh, the primary uh, election was first adopted, actually beginning in many southern states, but adopted uh, in a few other states and used. Uh, in that period, but by 1920, the push for the, um, the direct primary had sort of fallen off. The 1950s, the American Political Science Association, a lot of intellectual elites are then pushing for more party reform, um, but not much happens until um, things are beginning and ending here in Chicago. Um, the 1968 Democratic National Convention in Chicago where uh, the Chicago police uh, and at Daly's behest beat the living daylights out of the anti-war protesters and uh, those who didn't favor Hubert Humphrey, um, who was nominated in effect without entering a single primary that year. And that led to the mcgovern Fraser Commission in 1972 that introduced uh, the direct primary for, the d for nominating Democrats uh, for the presidency. And the, the Republicans followed over the next decade or so and that became the norm, um, you would say those would be the big inflection points. I don't know if any of them um, point us to uh, one now. I think what you're hearing, and maybe in my remarks, and maybe some of the things is people are a little bit having, uh, beginning to rethink, well, what could be done institutionally that might uh, change this freewheeling, individualistic, um, plebiscite-style system that we have? Um, so there's a few scholars out there, it's a small and lonely tribe um, that I think are beginning to think along these lines. Do what I say. Well, thank, thank you. you very much.